Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the life of St. Martin of Tours, forgive my voice, I have my voice left. Um, it is said, as he was a catechumen, he was still in the military. And St. Martin saw a man by the road. Some of you know this story. The man was older, cold, very cold, barely had any clothing. And none of the soldiers, of course, would give this young man or this old man anything. St. Martin cut the only cloak he had in two and gave to the old man. Of course, as they derided him for doing this and made fun of him for doing this, but not long after that, in that evening, the Lord appears to St. Martin on horseback, wearing that garment. And they can hear his voice, those who derided him, and he says, Martin, while still a catechumen, has given me his garment. Mercy has blessings. We know that from the lives of the saints over and over. Not only do we call this man Martin the Merciful now, we also have John the Merciful, the Patriarch of Alexandria. You probably remember the story of him continually giving to the same beggars and saying that the next one might be Christ testing him. He perpetually gave. We have Philaret the Merciful, who gave away all of his goods, every animal that he had for service, because someone needed them, despite his family being desperately upset with him. And what happens? He ends up being the relative of the emperor, because his daughter ends up marrying the emperor's, or the heir to the throne. He continued to give away all of his money, even then. And he was blessed over and over and over. These people are examples for us of what the man in the gospel today is not an example for us of. People who trust in God deeply and realize that money is not their own but has been given as a gift from God. And trust that God will help them if they are faithful with that gift. We too need to be faithful with that gift, especially in this season when we focus so much on buying and consuming, consuming things and constantly adding things to our collections of, of the house, which we eventually have to get rid of to the chagrin of our relatives and everyone else. And then we have to clean and cause chaos in our lives. And we need simplicity. And all the money when we look around our house and the things that we have accumulated are things that we could have helped our neighbor with, that we could have given to the church, that we could have enabled the church to help the poor with or build that temple that drew people to it. This man today, as the gospel begins, his land brought forth plentifully. It doesn't say he brought forth anything. The land brought forth plentifully. God gave him this gift. But he doesn't recognize that for what it is. His first concern is, what shall I do? I have no. Like he doesn't have anything. I have not bonds which to put these things in. So he must build bigger bonds. But this passion of avarice is not only for the wealthy. St. John Cassian tells us it is for the poor as well. Because both of them can say that phrase, What shall I do for I have no? Nothing is ever enough when we become subjects of money and mammon. The rich want more and more and want to add and add more to their treasuries and add to their comfort. The poor want more and more and aren't satisfied with the life they've been given. Having food and shelter to be satisfied with that, as St. Paul tells us, to be content with what we've been given. Remember that story of Metropolitan Anthony of Suraj, who talks about when he was pondering his monastic vows, living in the world, what he was to do. He had a stub of a pencil one day writing one of his sermons. And he realized he was greatly attached to that little stub of a pencil. And he sat there and wrestled for a good time to get rid of that pencil until he went down and gave it to his secretary or someone, because he realized he had an attachment to it. You hear about monks in the de desert arguing over a fork or some utensil they had. That's avarice too. It's the same sin as the first man had. So it's not only confined to the wealthy, even though it's more easy for the wealthy to fall into that one. This is a learned passion, St. Cassian tells us, because it is not something that we have in us naturally. We learn to want to accumulate things and to spend money. 
comes from the outside, but it must be fought. It must be remembered to give, as the Lord tells us to give, to give everything that we have. But this man, he says, I have no, he says, I must build bigger barns, not satisfied with what he has, so that he can live out the rest of his years, which he thinks he's got more. He gives, attributes that to himself as well. He doesn't know what his time is, as none of us know exactly when our time is. You know, me right now feeling a little sick might be a harbinger of my death. Indeed it is. All of those illnesses are. And we must take them that way to prepare ourselves for the end, to prepare ourselves for ultimately what is the beginning of life eternal. And so he says, what I will do is I will build these barns and I will take my ease and make merry and eat and drink. What foolishness, what foolishness to take our satisfaction with things of this world that way. I will just waste my time with revelry and drinking and eating. Which, what is the purpose of those things? To sustain the body, not to become ends in themselves, which unfortunately for so many they do become an end in themselves, all of us, some of the time. Some of us a lot of the time. That's our passion. We can't be content with what we've been given. And we are, of course, the largest country of weight in the world. We eat and we eat and we eat. We're never satisfied even with that. We want to build bigger barns and more food while the rest of the world starves. What happens? Fool this night, your soul be demanded of you. Indeed, that's true. How many of us have seen our own goods, or relatives of ours, then die, and then they have to pick through all that stuff, and half of it goes in the trash that the people accumulated, the rest of it they debate who goes to, or they fight in the family over who gets it. Absurdity. Look at the people in the scriptures who also did trusted in money and not in God. We have multitudes of examples. We have Gehazi, the disciple of Elisha, the prophet Elisha, who, when Elisha heals Naaman the Syrian, didn't take any money for it. But Gehazi, not liking this, goes out and, you know, through duplicitous means, convinces him that Elisha wants a little money to help someone with and takes money. Gehazi becomes afflicted with leprosy himself when Elisha knows this. We have the example, of course, of Judas. He has the very Lord and Savior himself. He chose 30 pieces of silver instead, the power of this world. And we have, of course, Ananias and Sapphira in the Acts of the Apostles, who, when the Apostles called them to give everything, I mean everything, they held some back because they didn't quite trust that God could make things well. And they were afflicted and died in that moment when Peter confronted them. It's a scary passage. That's something we should all consider. The early church called the faithful to give every single thing they had, every dime, to the church. So everybody could live together and help each other. The contemporary church sometimes asks for 10%, far less than 100%. And yet, we don't even want to do that. Our churches can't thrive because we don't trust that God can take care of us if we give our money. Because it's not our money. It's the Lord's money. The only reason we have it at all is because the Lord allowed us to have it. It was stewardship that we could take care of to the glory of God. Now here we are in this season, we need to give ourselves even more, consider it another Lent, which it is, to give of what we have, to cut back where we don't need, to really examine our lives, and to see the things that we are wasting money on, it's really just foolishness, it's not going to bring us joy, it's not going to bring us happiness. We know how happy it makes us when we do give it to someone, and to trust God. I have yet to meet the person in my life who is not a faithful giver, who didn't get by. That doesn't mean they thrived in the world's eyes, but they did well because God helped them, and they had peace in their hearts because they did not have money as an idol. 
So what should we do? We should take what we have and give as best we can to really examine our lives. What can be cut back? What's unnecessary? What's costing too much? Do we really need that super expensive cable plan and phone bill? Really? Do we need those extra wardrobe filling the closets that we don't wear? Do we need all those things sitting on the walls that we just have to dust or collect dust? Be honest with ourselves. Actually be brutally honest with ourselves. Use a scalpel in our lives and figure that out. Because there are plenty of people who do need it. And there are plenty of, plenty of good we can do. We can build up our lives with the kingdom of heaven. We build mansions for ourselves in heaven. We collect treasures for ourselves in heaven. Where our treasure deserves a heart also. And that's how we should live. If we don't have money to give, we need to give of ourselves. We need to give love. We need to give kindness, a kind word. We need to remember also in this season to increase our prayers, because it is a time of more repentance. Last night we had three or four people in church at the individual. It's unacceptable. That breaks my heart. Because in the traditional Orthodox countries, I can assure you, you can read any of their documents, pretty much considered standard for the reception of Holy Communion, when possible, is attendance of the service the night before. I do understand some people can't, but I doubt that that did them. So we really need to take this seriously. You will not find in the lives of the saints, and that's not just the monastics, it's the laity as well, any of those saints who did not devote themselves completely to their life in the church and their prayer life. And God blessed them richly. I was reading last week of story of Elder Ephraim's mother, which I knew about before, but she ended up becoming a great schema nun at the end of her life as well. She was Euronius, uh, um, oh, I'm forgetting her name now, but she took in monasticism. But she, every night he remembers as a child looking out in the kitchen, and she'd be in their knees praying in the middle of the night, and giving everything she had, and fasting extra days, adding to the fast because she wanted to give more life to God. We learn from people like this. I've been in lay people's homes in my life a few times where little old Mayas put me to shame. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed and I was exhausted. I could see them up at night praying. You can learn from them. And also they gave and they gave and they gave. We need to learn from these people. And give of ourselves and trust God that God wants our well-being as well as we do. He wants us to be okay. He wants to bless us. But he wants us to give of what we have, to bless those who don't have, to offer sacrifices of mercy. It's with reason that those few saints I mentioned at the beginning, Martin and John and Philaret, are called the merciful. This is a blessing. And blessed are the merciful, as we say in the Beatitudes. Amen. Amen.